We're going to look at our third theme, and uh, the passage we're looking at tonight is again from John's Gospel, chapter 13. Uh, I've not uh, looked at this sequentially. Last night was one of the resurrection appearances of of Jesus at Galilee, Uh, but tonight we're thinking about the night that Jesus was betrayed, and uh, particularly about the the foot washing uh, that we read about in John chapter 13. And the reason I've not gone for it sequentially was because as I was preparing, I just felt the the way the theme was unfolding, it probably fitted better tonight. We thought about in order to lead well, we need to be led. In order to lead well, we need to love. And tonight, in order to lead well, we need to serve. That's the essence of Christian service, this attitude of wanting to serve. Jesus said, the Son of Man came... Not to, not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And he says to us, as men who are followers, uh, as the Father sent me, I'm sending you. And we're going to read from John 13, and I'm going to pick it up at verse 1. It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and to go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, You do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then Lord, Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus answered, those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean and you're clean though not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him, and that was why he said not everyone was clean. When he'd finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you, he asked them? You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so. For that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I'm going to ask for an honesty test now. Would you put your hand up if you were alive in 1967? My well, you do wear well. You, You look good. 1967, right, that's about a third of you. Uh, The rest of you, this is a little bit of history. 25th of June, 1967, was the first live satellite satellite link-up around the world. 26 countries took place, and a viewing audience was 400 million. Compare that to the last Olympics, and the millions upon millions that tuned in. But this was a breakthrough. The technological breakthrough, the very first link-up, live link-up via satellite 
around the world. 26 countries, 400 million viewers. And uh, there was a small band from the north of England called the Beatles, you may have heard of them, who uh, around about that time in uh, the late 60s were really hitting the big time. And so Lennon and McCartney were asked by the BBC uh, to write a song. They were commissioned to write a song. And the idea was that each of the 26 countries would put something on as a kind of a, a one world theme. That was the, the, the name of the show, One World. Something that expressed a, a, a kind of a global aspiration, a global hope to these countries that were being linked up by satellite. And Lennon and McCartney put on their thinking caps and they came up with a little number called All You Need Is Love. Should we try it? All you need is love, la 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 da. All you need is love, da 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 da. All you need is love, is love. Love is all you need. I didn't think you'd do that. <laughs> I didn't think, I thought they're never gonna do, they're gonna, they're gonna lose their bottle, but you did it. I was gonna suggest we all sort of, but no, no, that's going a bit too far. And that song went global. It, it encapsulated something of the spirit of, of the age. It was the time of flower power. People were, you know, dropping out and turning on and make love, not war. Remember all that stuff? And that, that theme, all you need is love, love is all you need, all you need is love, love is all you need, all you need is love. Okay, so what went wrong? That was 1967. This is 2019. More wars, more violence, more injustice, more cruelty. So what, what, what was it? Do, does the world not leave love? Yes, it does. But it needs a different kind of love. It needs the love shown by God in the work of his son, the Lord Jesus. The Bible often uses the word agape, to describe divine love. It, it's a word which is not based on attraction. The Greeks had different words for love. Uh, some of them based on family uh, relationships, sometimes on a kind of a, a filial, a brotherly loyalty, sometimes eros, erotic love. But agape is a different kind of word because it's, it's a word that's centered in the will. It's a choice to love. It's a choice to love that which is not lovely. That's the kind of love the world needs. You see, Lennon and McCartney and many other songwriters like them speak about a love that says, I'll love you as long as you're attractive. I'll love you till a better offer arrives. I'll love you while I'm feeling good. We'll be re reminded tonight how unreliable our feelings are. But the love of God is demonstrated for us in this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's scripture. While we were en enemies of God, alienated from God, Christ died for us. That's the kind of love that the world needs. Let's look at this passage together. Several things I want you to notice this evening as we think about what it means to be servants for Jesus' sake. The first thing I want you to notice is, is it's a significant time in the gospel story. Uh, John puts it this way in verse 1. It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. In John's gospel, this thing about the hour is significant. Jesus uh, talks about his hour having not yet come. There's an occasion earlier on in the gospel when uh, his brothers were trying to persuade him somewhat cynically, because they didn't believe in him, to go up to Jerusalem. And, and Jesus' reply to them was, for you, any time is right, but my hour has not yet come. And so there's this great significance of the hour. And what Jesus meant by that was the Father's timetable. Because he wasn't living according to his own will, but according to the will of the Father. Jesus came, the second Adam, to restore what the first Adam had blown. He fulfilled the Father's will in every aspect. And fascinating, in, in the Greek language, they, um, they have uh, two different words they use for time. There's a word chronos, from which we get chronology. 
And that indicates sequential, uh, quantitative time, the time that's measured by hours and minutes. When you look at your watch, you, you see the hours and the minutes. That's described as chronos. But there's another word, and it's the word kairos, and that describes significant, qualitative, key moments in our lives, special moments. And this is a very special moment for Jesus in the purpose of God. He's sharing a meal with his disciples. In a few hours, he will be betrayed, he will be arrested, and that whole sequence of events that will begin that lead to the cross and all the suffering of the cross, and then on the third day to be raised to life again. This is the climax of his mission. It's the kairos, the, the time that God had appointed. I don't know as a disciple uh, how you begin your day. I begin my day by taking some time to be with God, and I try to, each day, lay out my day before God and pray about some of the things that are planned, some of the people I have to meet. But I always try hard to pray something like this. Father, you know what I have planned today, but please don't let me miss what you have planned today. May my plans be subject to your great plan. And what I'm really praying when I pray that is that my chronos life may have space for kairos moments. That in the routine that I have and the things that I have to do and the programs I have to teach and the people that I have appointments to see, that I may not miss the significant things that God has for me. It may be a conversation over the phone. It may be stopping to answer an email. It may be stopping a student in the corridor just to have a conversation. But in the busyness of our Kronos lives, let's not miss those Kairos opportunities. Chatting to some of you over the weekend, I've been aware how busy you are. A number of you have said it's just been great this weekend just to hit the pause button, to have a space to enjoy fellowship, to enjoy worship, to enjoy the creation that God's made. Can I say before you get into the merry-go-round of life again, that you pray that God will give you the ability day by day to ask him for those moments, those significant moments to be worked out and for you not to miss them. Here's the second thing I want you to notice. I've described it as a secure relationship because John, who wrote this gospel, deliberately says that Jesus knew, verses 2 and 3, that the Father had put everything under his authority. He was ready to go to the Father. Uh, verse uh, 3, Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power. That's speaking about authority. What he, he means by that is the Father had given him uh, that authority. All things were under his power. It's interesting, when Jesus stands uh, before Pilate, he says, you, you wouldn't have any power over me unless it was given to you from above. You don't take, your life, you don't take my life from me. I lay it down of my own accord in order that I may take it up again. So Jesus is working under the authority of heaven. We thought about that on Friday. Then it talks about his identity. He knew that he had come from God. He knew as the son of the father, he'd come to earth with a mission. And he knew about his destiny, that he was returning to God. He knew about authority. He knew about his identity. And he knew about his destiny. And on the basis of that in verse 4, he gets up. And he takes the towel and he takes the bowl. He wraps it around his waist. In the light of that sense of security in God, knowing that his life was bound up with God's overall salvation purpose, Jesus is able to take this place. John's quite uh, keen to underline that, that it was not from a place fear or insecurity, although he dreaded the cross, it was an obedience to the Father, his sense of identity and who he was in God, his authority and his destiny. And, and men, we need to be so secure. That song that we just sung, 
Where do I find my worth? Where do I find my value? It's not in my salary. It's not in my rank. It's not in my achievements. My value is in the cross. To one does I confess my worth and my unworthiness. Do you, do you get that lyric? I am valuable and yet I'm unworthy because that's what grace is all about. I think one of the most iconic images of the 20th century is um, the face of Albert Einstein because he looked like a mad professor. You agree? And uh, I, there's a lovely photograph I've got at home of him his shock of hair all over the place, and obviously the camera, the photographer had just called to him, Professor, and he spun round, and as the photographer took the picture, he stuck his tongue out. It's a fantastic picture. Nobel Prize winner, the man who uh, discovered the theory of relativity when most of us didn't know it and got lost. Um, this amazing uh, genius. The story is told that Einstein, when he, he was lecturing towards the end of his life at Princeton, uh, he used to often take the suburban train. And you can imagine, with a face like that, you're instantly recognisable wherever you go. And so people on the platform would sort of nudge each other and say, there he is, Nobel Prize winner, Albert Einstein. And the story told that one day he was on a suburban train and the conductor was coming through checking tickets and uh, Einstein is trying to find in his pockets the ticket. And he's looking in his briefcase and he's searching and the conductor says, Sir, I know who you are, Professor. Please don't worry. I recognise you. I know you've got a ticket. Just be, be at peace. And he moved through the train. About 15 minutes later, he comes back through the compartment and Einstein is now on his hands and knees looking under the seat. And he rushes to him and says, Professor, please don't trouble yourself. I, I know you've, you've got a ticket. I trust you. I know who you are. And I said, young man, I know you know who I am. I know who I am. What I don't know is where am I meant to be going? <laughs> that story's not original to me. Billy Graham told it when they gave him the freedom of the city of Charlotte. And the city fathers honoured him uh, with a banquet, a special meal. And when he got up to give his response he told that story and then he added this he said one day you'll hear that Billy Graham is dead don't believe it for a minute by the way he said I'll be more alive than I've ever been but I said I want you to know that I know who I am I know whose I am and I know where I'm going and typically he went on to use an occasion that was there to honor him to preach the good news about Jesus and to explain how lost people could be found by a saviour who loved them so much he left the glory of heaven and came to this earth to die for them. I know who I am, I know whose I am, and I know where I'm going. And guys, because I'm a, a visitor and I'm British and a bit weird, I can ask you that question tonight. Man to man, do you know who, whose you are? Do you know that you're saved by grace? Do you know if you were to die tonight, you'd go into the presence of God and be more alive than you've ever been before? Do you know that Jesus is your saviour? Tonight is the night to say yes to him. The third thing I want you to notice is this surprising event. Jesus washes the feet of his disciples. I don't know whether any of you have seen the International Bible Society have produced some dramatised... Uh, versions of different Gospels. They haven't added anything to it, it's just the text of the New International Version, but it's, uh, it's performed by actors. And uh, if I'd got the, the DVD with me tonight, I would have played it, because th th there's a wonderful bit where Jesus suddenly gets up and begins to put the towel around his waist and fill the bowl, and it's the look on the faces of the disciples. They're in a hired room, a, a borrowed room. Normally in a, in a family, in, in a house, uh, the lowest servant, the, the one at the bottom of the pecking order, would come and would wash the feet of those who'd come in. Their feet were dirty and dusty from, from the roads. And that was the way that you welcomed the guest into your house. But a bunch of guys, they're just thinking, oh, well, forget it, you know. 
like most of you this weekend with personal hygiene because your wife's not here. <laughs> yeah? That's, that's what they're thinking. It doesn't really matter. But the look on their faces when Jesus gets up to do it, you can see them like, oh no, one of us should have done that. One of us should have done it. But Jesus does it. And you can see as he moves around the circle, the sense of discomfort. And when he gets to Peter, that's the best bit in the dramatization, when Peter says, no, Lord, there's no way that you're going to do that to me. You know, forget these other guys, they're going to allow you to, but no way. And then Jesus says, well, I tell you, if I know, you don't have any part in me. And Peter's face changes. And, and you can see, that, well, okay, but well, give me the lot. Just tip it all over me. You remember what we said last night about his impetuosity? Demonstrated there. But just the poignancy of Jesus taking the lowest place. Now, what was the point of that? Well, there was a, a symbolic reason. It was a, a declaration of the incarnation. What did Jesus do? He laid aside the glory of heaven in the same way that he took off his outer robe and he humbled himself and came to this earth. So there's something of the dramatization of the incarnation, but there's also a prefigurement of Calvary. There's something of a, a prophetic enactment of all that Calvary was going to mean, that on the cross as he laid down his life, his blood poured out was going to be the atoning sacrifice for sin. The mean, means of washing and cleansing and bringing forgiveness and righteousness to unholy people. And so there's definitely something symbolic here. But it was also an actual thing. It was a demonstration of lowliness, of humility. If you want to know what servant love looks like, look at John 13. I sometimes make long-haul flights. And I remember coming back from Australia a few years ago, very long flight. I don't tend to sleep well on planes, and I just was sort of observing the crew through the night, uh, large passenger jet, and these people just running up and down the aisles, serving people, answering questions, giving out blankets, giving out pillows, answering <coughs> questions, helping parents who had children who were distressed, all, all that kind of thing. And as I sat there reflecting on it, I thought, you know, this is like some people's view of church. The vast majority sitting back enjoying the in-flight entertainment, being served by a dozen people running up and down, serving their needs. Pressing call buttons, what can I do to help you? And I realised that that is very much a modern consumerist view of church. It's not a biblical view of church. It's not a New Testament understanding of what church is about. Some of you have been asking about our visit to uh, Israel, and if when we get there you, you're able to join us, we'll probably go to the uh, Christian hospital in Nazareth. And in the chapel of the hospital, uh, there is a, a, a communion table, and it's a carpenter's bench. Symbolic. Jesus grew up in Nazareth, the son of the carpenter, and took on Joseph's business, at least for some time. And so they've got this replica, this facsimile of a carpenter's bench from that period of history. And on the bench, there's a whole selection of tools. The kind of thing that Jesus would have been familiar with. But here's the significant thing. The handles of the tools are not facing the pastor or the priest. They're facing the congregation. Because the Christian faith, the Christian gospel is lived out when you and I, in gratitude, seek to emulate Jesus with a life of service and a life of giving. I had a, a meal some time ago with a couple in ministry. My wife Ruth and I were involved at the beginning of their journey in ministry. They've now been in ministry for 25 years. And uh, we, we said to them, okay, what, what have you been learning 25 years? And they said, well, one thing we've noticed is now people are demanding more but giving less. 
That was their reflection. Pastoring a, a, a thriving church, but they said, we, we notice that people are demanding more but giving less. And it's because we're moving away from a biblical understanding of what it means to be servants. And here's the fourth thing. It's a very simple command. You see it in verse 17? The Lord Jesus says, Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Jesus is saying to his disciples, I am I'm giving you this as a living example of what servanthood looks like. It means putting yourself in the lowest place. It means doing the job that nobody else wants to do. It means even washing the feet of Judas. Yet Judas was there. He washed the feet of the one who betrayed him. He washed Peter's feet, the one who denied him. He washed Thomas's feet, the one who doubted him. You see, it's unconditional love. Not love that says, I love you when you do it well, but I love you full stop. You know, the intriguing thing about this is that John is the only gospel writer who records this. John's gospel is different for lots and lots of uh, different reasons. And the scholars, the academics love to debate and look at it and explain why. But John doesn't have the Last Supper in the sense of bread and wine. He, he doesn't mention it. But he mentions what the others don't mention, and that is that Jesus took a towel and a bowl. And so the speculation is, well, did they get it wrong? Did John get it right? What, what was going on? I think what was happening was, by the time John wrote his gospel, which was the last one to be written, he knew that Eucharist had taken off, the communion, the Lord's Supper, the Lord's Table. He knew that believers in various parts of the empire, the Roman Empire, when they were meeting together, they were remembering Jesus on the first day of the week, the resurrection day, the Lord's Day, the day that he was raised. And they were breaking bread, they were drinking wine, they were remembering Jesus. So by the time he wrote his gospel, this was a given. But the bit that had been forgotten was the other part of the supper, when Jesus took a towel and a bowl, as well as the bread and the wine. And so John is actually addressing something that was forgotten. Paul suggests that, doesn't he, when he writes to the Corinthians? Because the Lord's Supper, the Lord's Table, was being abused. People were overeating and overdrinking. And that's why Paul writes the corrective that he does to the Corinthian church about why it's being done and how it should be done. And John, in his own way, is saying, and remember too, it's not about some personal blessing of salvation that we have in Christ, true though that is, but it's about mutually serving the body. It's about washing people's feet. It's about demonstrating love as Jesus demonstrated love. You see, it's got to be translated into our cultural context. It's not so much about the ceremony that you take your walking boots off and your socks and we all get a bowl and start to wash each other's feet. Don't really want to go there tonight. But it's about the equivalent of that. It's as much about service as a ceremony. It's about what's the equivalent way we serve one another in our context. I remember being part of a leadership uh, group, group of leaders. We were going to have a uh, a communion service over Easter weekend. We were all from different churches in the city. And somebody said, wouldn't it be good to get hold of, our, of John chapter 13 and do something that was appropriate? And we decided that the, the simple thing for us in the context we were living was, we are wash our hands before we eat food. Don't need to wash our feet because we don't live in a dusty climate, but to wash our hands. And so we asked the congregation from different churches to wash one another's hands bowls, towels, so it was a moving time. Leaders from different churches that hadn't always got on well, washing one another's hands, saying we want to bless you in the name of the Lord. That was the, the cultural interpretation. I had a wonderful one about a group of young people in the south of England. 
uh, their youth pastor had been taking them through a series of Bible studies on grace and emphasizing that grace is the favor of God that we don't deserve. And so they've been doing various uh, sort of studies and he got to the end of it and he threw out a challenge. He said, I want you on your own initiative, I'm not going to organize this, I want you to go out and demonstrate in our community what undeserved favor looks like. And in his mind, I think, he thought they'd probably go and pick up litter in a park somewhere, you know, something like that. But what these kids decided to do is they pooled their pocket money and on a Saturday morning, they went down to the near shopping car park. And the shopper's car park is one where you put a pound coin into a machine and you've got two hours parking. And people go into the supermarkets and the stores and then they come back. These kids positioned themselves by the meters and when people came to put their pound in, they said, please don't worry, we've got some money here. And they put the coin in and they gave people the ticket. And they said, why are you doing this? They said, well, we're from such and such a church and we've been learning about undeserved love and grace and we were told to go out and do something. So that's what we're doing. Have a nice day. The CCTV cameras in the car park picked this up and the police sent two squad cars. Because as far as they were concerned, these were kids intimidating shoppers and threatening them. And when they said, no, 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 we're not doing it, we're, we're paying their parking ticket, they said, forget it, there's no such thing as a free lunch, you're nicked. And took them down to the police station. They phoned the youth leader, who turned up very, very embarrassed about half an hour later. Can you verify these young people? I can. And what are they doing? they're giving out free parking. There's no such thing as a free lunch, son. Well, actually, there is. It's called the gospel. And those young kids were actually demonstrating something that they'd heard and been told, go out and prove it. God's unmerited favor. I'm going to ask Jeremy if we could put that picture up. Is that possible? I don't know if any, any of you have seen it. It's by um, a, an artist, an American artist, called Max Greinhardt. And um, it's uh, cast in bronze, and it's called The Divine Servant. Now, when I Googled it some years ago, I found there are various copies of this that appear in churches and on university campuses in the US. But when I came across it, it was about 16 years ago, I was in the US, and a friend of mine was speaking at a missions conference. I was over there doing other things, but uh, I said to him one evening, let me come with you. I'll, uh, I'll drive you and I'll be there cheering for you. So I went along as a guest. My friend was speaking at this missions conference. When we got there, he was whisked off by the pastor somewhere and I'm just wandering around the church and so having a look. When I came into the lobby, this, a copy of this was in the lobby and it was three times actual size. So you imagine Jesus, Peter, three times life size. And the first thing that went through my head was, who on earth stuck that there? It's right in the middle of the vestibule. And I'm thinking any parent with a stroller is gonna have to move their way around that, a wheelchair user or somebody coming in who's on crutches, and I'm, in my head, I'm just thinking, as a working pastor, that is a nightmare. And then I thought, hang on. This is their mission statement. It's deliberately big. It's deliberately awkward. You can't walk through it. You have to navigate around it. Because that church was saying, the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And as the Father sends me, so I send you. It was their mission statement. I've never forgotten that. They didn't have it just neatly written in a little plaque on a wall, but they had it in the middle of the vestibule. You cannot get round it. So here's my question, guys. Whose feet is Jesus calling me to wash? In the church that I'm part of. 
or maybe the office or the team that I'm part of, people who don't yet know Jesus, and yet their feet need washing. I sat down this afternoon and just began to write a list, I guess for myself as much as for you, because I sit under the word, I listen to the word, as much as I hope you do too. And I began to make a list. I wash feet through hospitality, opening my home, sharing food. I wash feet by offering friendship. I wash feet by words of encouragement. I wash feet when I give practical help, the loan of a car or the use of a holiday home. I wash feet when I help someone who is alone and separated from their family. I wash feet through financial giving, we did earlier. I wash feet when I look out for those in a hard place and offer to do something to ease their load. I wash feet when I help those who are new in the faith. I wash feet when I tackle a job that no one else wants to do. I wash feet when I give something away. I wash feet when I give time to listen. I wash feet in random acts of kindness. Don't have to blow a trumpet, but just to do it quietly. Like the time when my family were little and I got up to go and pay a bill in a restaurant and the lady behind the counter said, there was a guy 20 minutes ago who paid your bill. I, as far as I was aware, nobody in that restaurant knew who I was. I certainly didn't know who they were. A random act of kindness. Only this morning, I, uh, in my reading, uh, was reading what we sometimes call the forgotten saying of Jesus. It occurs in the book of Acts chapter 20. Paul is preaching to the leaders of the church at Ephesus. And um, he's giving them some words of exhortation, uh, encouragement. He's saying it because he knows he's not going to see them on earth again. So it's quite a poignant sermon. And right at the end of it, he says, don't forget the words of the Lord Jesus. It is more blessed to give than to receive. Acts 20.35, if you're making notes. Now, if Paul hadn't said it, we wouldn't know that Jesus had said it because it doesn't occur anywhere in the Gospels. So it must mean that Paul and maybe some of the other apostles had got a collection of the sayings of Jesus and the teaching of Jesus, and this one didn't make it into the Gospel narratives. So thank you, Paul, for giving us what's sometimes called the forgotten saying of Jesus. It is more blessed to give than to receive. Now, if you'd asked me at the age of 10 if that was true, I'd have said no. (laughs) Most of us would say that. It's more blessed to get than to give, yeah? But have you noticed as you've moved on in your faith, as you've moved on in life, as you've become a dad, maybe a granddad, you've discovered it is more blessed to give than to receive. There's a blessing attached to giving, particularly sacrificial giving. It's a blessing that you, you just can't make up. Jesus said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. The song that we sang a few moments ago was written by Keith and Kristen Getty with my friend Graham Kendrick. The three of them conspired together. And one of Kendrick's greatest songs is one called The Servant King. And the final verse of that says this, So let us learn how to serve. And in our hearts enthrone him. Each other's needs prefer, for it is Christ we're serving. I had the privilege in my life of meeting Mother Teresa not once but twice, by accident. Well, Kairos moment. I remember her saying to me, if you want to get close to Jesus, get among the people who are poor. You'll find Jesus there. Serve, give, love. I've got a real sense in my heart that some of you, while you've been here, and I know this because some of you have mentioned it to me in different conversations, that are asking God about the future. And a sense that some of you know that you're being called to lead. 
And I hope that the studies that we've been looking at together have helped you. You've discovered about the need to be led in order to lead well. You need to love in order to lead well because it's coming out of that sense of love and devotion for Jesus, not some professional expertise, but recognising that you're a sinner saved by grace and out of a heart of gratitude you want to follow him. And we need to serve. What we need in our world today, not just in the church but in the world, are servant leaders. Men, women who are willing to put aside self-interest in order to serve the purpose of God and to demonstrate the love of God in our lives. I'm a, a big Eric Clapton fan. For those of you who've had a sheltered upbringing, he's not a Baptist pastor. But um, I love Clapton's music, have done since uh, I was a kid. But some years ago, he brought out his autobiography. And um, in his autobiography, he revealed something that he'd not gone public with before, and that is that his, the, the couple that brought him up as he thought his mum and dad were actually his grandparents. They weren't his, his mum and dad. And he revealed to the world um, that his mum had been a teenager who got pregnant. This was the late 40s. And uh, socially, that was a very unacceptable thing. And so she had the baby, Eric was born, and she was sort of spirited away. And grandma and granddad brought him up as he were their son. As far as he was concerned, uh, this lady was his sister. She'd moved away to Canada. She came back to visit. By now, she was married. She had got some children. And she came to visit with her family. And Eric overheard a conversation that he shouldn't have overheard and realised that this lady that he thought was his sister was actually his mum. And he was thrilled. Absolutely thrilled. And began to talk to her about this. And she was very defensive. You can't say a word. It'll completely mess everything up. Let's just keep the story as it is. And he felt utterly devastated. And if you know anything about Clapton's life, his abuse alcohol, drugs, pursuing women, particularly unattainable women. He had an affair with George Harrison's wife and uh, pursued her until she, she sort of gave in. But that, that's the story of the guy's life. He was interviewed by one of the top journalists in the UK when the book came out, a lady called Chrissy Eiley, and she, she said to him, have you, have you formed a relationship with your mother now, you know, you're in your adult life? And he said, well, yes, yeah, sort of. She's actually passed away now. Did, did you have some kind of ongoing relationship? Well, sort of, it wasn't easy. Then she asked a killer question. She said, did she ever tell you that she loved you? And Clapton said she did. But love is not a feeling, it's an action. Love is not a feeling, it's an action. All you need is love, all you need is love. Not some kind of slushy romantic feeling that changes when the weather changes, but the kind of love that led Jesus to leave the glory of heaven and come to the cross in order that people who were very unlovely People like me, people like you, might be redeemed and ransomed and restored and forgiven. That's the love that changes the world. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we just stand amazed when we, we think of all that you came to this earth to reveal and to do staggering to think, Lord, that you, you washed the feet of Peter, of Judas, of Thomas, people who would deny you, betray you, doubt you, and yet, Lord, we're just in this room. That's, that's where we are. We have our doubts, we have our denials, and sometimes our betrayals. Lord, thank you for your great love that reaches us where we are. Thank you for some of us this weekend. You've been reminding us that your love is unconditional, but we pray that you'd Send us out with a spirit to serve, 
in whatever way you're calling us to. And Lord, I, I want to pray tonight in faith that you would open our eyes to situations, to people, be that in our church, in our family circle, in our work, wherever it might be. Lord, open our eyes and open our hands to be your agents, your servants in the world. And we pray this for your glory. Amen.